Live from the studios at Brigham Young University, the award-winning 11 News at Noon starts now. Murder trial. The hearing begins for the Salt Lake City doctor accused of killing his ex-wife. House fire. Lehigh fire crews rush to extinguish a home in flames. And drive through drama. Why pedestrians and cyclists are feeling left out at the pickup window. I'm Katie Ryan. And I'm Tani Zambrano. Welcome to 11 News at Noon. A former Utah doctor is facing a jury of the murder of his ex-wife in 2011. Prosecutors say 51-year-old John Brickman Wall killed 49-year-old Uta Von Schwedler. Her boyfriend found her dead body in an overflowing bathtub. And prosecutors say the question for the jury is whether Von Schwedler's death was a homicide or a suicide. District attorneys say that while the case against Wall may be circumstantial, the evidence is overwhelming. But Wall's defense attorney warned the jury not to leave common sense at the door and remember they should presume his client is innocent. The trial continues this afternoon. Orem police have identified the victim and shooter as well as a possible motive in yesterday's murder-suicide. They say 24-year-old Riley Meekum shot his grandmother's boyfriend, 64-year-old Holden Sorensen, after long-running and mutual dislike turned into a heated argument and gunfire. Family friends say Meekum was a good kid and this is just a sad situation. Former Davis High teacher Brianne Altice's request to dismiss one of her rape charges gets nowhere with the judge. The defense claims Altice was not in a position of trust because she was not the student's teacher at the time of the event. Judge Thomas K. ruled to keep the charges because Altice and the student began the student-teacher relationship before any sexual acts occurred. An Eagle Mountain man is behind bars after he allegedly sold a computer containing child pornography online. Officers say 45-year-old Philip Case's old hard drive had child porn on it and they found even more porn on his laptop. The woman who bought the computer contacted police after she found the pictures. In case is now facing seven counts of sexual, sexual exploitation of a minor. A man with more than 10 arrest warrants is behind bars after police pulled over to help him with his car. Officers say 40-year-old Nevada Jacobson started panicking when they pulled up behind his stopped vehicle to assist him. They say Jacobson told him that he had just used meth and had other drugs. Jacobson's warrants include bad checks, drugs, drug possession, and theft. A Lehigh family's house burst into flames early this morning. Lehigh and Saratoga Springs Fire Departments responded to this house on, 30, on 385 North and 300 West just after 7 a.m., but the cause of the fire is still under investigation. There were no injuries reported, and they haven't told us how extensive the damage is. The homeowners did not comment on the fire. Have you ever gone through a drive-up window on your bike to get food? Probably not. But a new ordinance in Salt Lake City requires restaurants with drive through windows to serve customers on bikes. Some state lawmakers aren't happy about the new law, and now a bill is in the works to, get to ban similar ordinances. 11 News reporter Jeremy Harris is covering this story. Jeremy, some say not allowing bikes is a form of discrimination. That's right. Supporters of Salt Lake City's new law say that it's discrimination for a restaurant to be open, but only to people who have cars. That new Salt Lake City law stirred a lot of controversy from restaurant owners who say they have safety concerns about having bicycles and pedestrians in line with the cars. Now a Senate bill would effectively ban cities and towns from enacting measures that obligate restaurants to serve cyclists through the drive-up window. For a government entity to require that of a business to impose that additional risk uh, I believe is going too far. So it is appropriate for the state to step in and, and say, no, that's, that's a line that has been crossed and something that, uh, that you know, we will roll back. In the committee hearing, Senator Karen Maine pointed out it would be impractical for a cyclist to order food through a drive-up window because he or she would have to maintain two hands on the bike and couldn't carry the food. Salt Lake County Sheriff Jim Winder also presented a letter to the committee that expressed concern about an increase in crime related to allowing bikes and pedestrians at drive-ups. Now that bill passed through committee with a four to one vote. It now moves on to the Senate floor where it will be voted on again. From the state capitol, Jeremy Harris, 11 News. Thank you, Jeremy. The Provo Municipal Council is making the final decision on a program to go green using renewable energy. It's called Renew Choice, and the initial energy would come from the wind. Provo's energy director says the cost will be $2 per 100 kilowatt hour. If the council votes yes on March 3rd, businesses and private homes could sign up. A small name change for BYU's Department of Communications means big things for its students. Instead of the Department of Communications, it's now known as the BYU School of Communications, effective immediately. 
Associate Director Dale Cressman says the name change will help students because prospective employers or graduate schools will recognize the size and stability of their program. And BYU's Marriott School of Management ranks as the best program in the United States for graduates' ability to pay back debt. The ratings stem graduates' job prospects, average starting salary, and student loan debt levels. BYU's Marriott School received the only A-plus rating in the nation, outperforming elite universities like Harvard and Stanford. Can you believe that? I am so impressed. Yeah, that's such an honor. I know. So I, good. Do you just feel so proud to be at BYU right now? I know. Now? I'm, I'm proud to be at BYU right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when 11 News at Noon continues, stop, collaborate, you're under arrest? Why this rap star charged with burglary is saying it's all a misunderstanding. And one book, two book, red book, new book. More than 20 years after his death, a newly discovered Dr. Seuss book is on its way to the library shelves. Stay with us. Clearfield is gaining 600 new jobs with AAA opening a new call center. The dispatch facility will provide roadside assistance service to more than 4 million AAA members across the country, including 200,000 in Utah. The center expects to open as soon as April and be fully operational by January. The State Health Department and Intermountain Healthcare are working together to fight pain medication abuse. 11 News reporter Juliana Collado met with an expert on the campaign. So Juliana, what exactly is this partnership all about? Katie, many Utahns have leftover prescription medicine in their houses, which could lead to misuse, abuse, or theft. I got to meet one woman who experienced just how damaging pain bill abuse can be. John Petri is a research professor at BYU focused on helping people understand how the human brain works, including addiction. Her motivation comes from her own experience, since one of her children died from a drug overdose. His um, heroin addiction had not started out that way. It actually was uh, an opiate pain pill, uh, prescribed, legally prescribed. Petri's son is one of the many Utahns who die of prescription drug abuse, a trend that is rising more each year. The state says Utah has a high percentage of deaths from prescription medicine, even higher than a car accident related deaths. The state is turning to its largest health care system for help. Janet Frank works in the Public Relations Department and Intermountain Healthcare and is working hard to get Utah off that list. They are partnering with the Utah Health Department on a campaign called Use Only as Directed. It focuses on teaching and creating awareness of the growing trend to prevent more deaths. We felt it was very important to partner with the Health Department so that more people can hear that message and understand the guidelines for disposing of medication. A part of the awareness movement include having containers for the disposal of unused medication in certain pharmacies. One of the things Joanne recommended from her personal experience is to be very careful with prescription medication. Authorities also encourage us to become more aware of this new trend and help them fight it. Live in the newsroom, Juliana Colado, 11 News. So what exactly can people at home do to start right now? Well, you can get all the medicine you don't use anymore and drop them off in those containers I mentioned. I put a link on the website at 11news.byu.edu to help you locate your nearest drop-off point. Thank you, Juliana. Vanilla ice is in hot water, the presidents make national parks free for fourth graders, and another Dr. Seuss book is hitting the shelves. Here's your look at news from across the nation. Former rapper Vanilla Ice is in facing charges in Florida of burglary and grand theft. Police say the rapper broke into a house and stole furniture, bikes, and other household items. The home is next door to a house that Ice is renovating for his DIY network reality TV show. Vanilla Ice says that it is all just a big misunderstanding. Fourth graders and their families will have free access to national parks starting this fall. The White House says they want the 80% of American families that live in urban areas to get, to get out more. A national park pass formally, normally costs about $80, so the Obama administration hopes the free admissions give families an incentive to go explore the parks. This new initiative will last for a full year. And another Dr. Seuss book is officially coming to a library near you. The late author's widow was cleaning out his office space and discovered a manuscript to a story he wrote in the 50s or 60s. The book title is What Pet Should I Get? and will come out this July. Two more Seuss books from newly discovered material are also in the works. And that's your look at news from across the nation. Katie? Aubrey, the weather has been so nice this week. Will it keep up in the weekend? Well, there's a chance it might, but maybe not. I'll have all the details for you when we come back.
Happy Thursday, Utah. Let's show you what's happening outside right now. It's a beautiful day. There are a few clouds in the sky, a little bit of haze, but the snow is still pretty high up on the mountain for February. We're used to seeing it uh, way further down here, but hey, I'll take it. It's beautiful. Currently in Provo right now, we're looking at 50 degrees, 59% uh, humidity with 8 mile per hour winds. So it's a great day for a power walk, uh, but if you're not moving quickly, you might still want a jacket. Uh, across the nation, we are seeing storms continuing to brew all over the East Coast. Uh, the Southern East Coast hasn't had weather like this since the mid-1990s. Uh, as far as California goes, they're still in a drought. And Utah, well, we do not seem to be getting any of, of these storms passing our way yet. Uh, as far as today is looking, though, across Utah, we are seeing 50s, 60s, and St. George, of course, warmer down there with 73. But a beautiful day, a little more cloudy in the north, but we'll take it. Uh, southern Utah, similar story. A few more clouds in the north, but we're seeing beautiful temperatures uh, for a February winter night sky. You might be able to see some stars tonight. Uh, as far as what we're going to see for the rest of the week, southern Utah may get a bit of a change. Uh, they usually have sunny weather, sunny, beautiful weather, but they might see uh, some storms on Sunday. Uh, slight chance of storms on Sunday, but there could be some rain. And then northern Utah, we're going to see possibly a lot more action. Uh, we are going to have a, a partly cloudy day today, but shouldn't be too bad. And then tomorrow, there's a 30% chance of rain and snow. And then on Saturday, a 40% chance of rain and snow. Sunday, we're looking at 20% chance of just snow. And then by Monday, it should be beautiful. And back to our normal February weather, at least normal for this year. Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, are you excited that the possibility of more snow? Uh, not, not so, so much. much. <laughs> At least we had a nice weekend, a long weekend last weekend. Yeah, right? I feel like it's just such a tease, you know? Yeah, yeah not a great weekend cool. for outside sports, but maybe for inside? Definitely not outside sports, but inside sports are still going. We've got a basketball game tonight. You know, we've got hockey, but I have a unique sport to talk about today, water polo. BYU, did you know they have a water polo team? We'll tell you about it when 11 Sports comes back. Power in the polo. BYU's water polo team is turning heads and trying to move their way up from a club to a recognized university sport. And we've got your deflate gate update. Two Controversy still big. stirring as leaks about the Patriots' deflated footballs continue to come out. We'll tell you about them on sports coming up next. A group of BYU students dive into the Richards Building pool every Saturday morning to swim, push, kick, shoot, and rack up points. 11 Sports reporter Cody Meredith caught up with the BYU Water Polo Club to learn more about the sport. Below the water, a quiet, calm scene. Above the water, chaos. Close quarters and a lot of bodies make water polo very physical. Players say there is a lot that the refs don't see, but they don't mind that at all. It's basically the combination of a bunch of sports, and it's a lot of fun if you like to be competitive. If you're not so competitive, I would switch, like, stick to a different sport. Players need to be in great shape to combine treading water, swimming, and shooting. Club president Josh Jumstead says the team needs to practice consistently to keep up. We usually scrimmage for about an hour, and if you average it out, they're swimming at least half a mile, even some of the players swim a mile every every scrimmage. The BYU team plays against club teams from around Utah Valley, but it's more than just college teams that love to play. We play in a league with University of Utah, Utah State, a few teams up in Harriman, um, some masters team, which is like older people, but that just goes to show that everyone likes to play even until they're like 60 to 70. The water polo team is just a club right now but the players are hoping to grow it into a BYU recognized sport. We would really love that in the future years to come. Um, it's definitely a possibility. We have a lot to do to get there, but it's, it's not far off. Jumstead says he hopes more people come out to try water polo. Fans can find the team's schedule and practice times by visiting our website, 11news.byu.edu. Just because the NBA is on a break doesn't mean there's not plenty of basketball to watch. The Tint View High School girls basketball team took on Skyline in the 4A state quarterfinals this morning. 
Skyline had the lead most of the game, but Tidview held their own with sisters Lindy and Lacey Haddock having powerful performances. In the end, though, Skyline took the win 47-43 to and will advance to the semifinals. Update in the NFL's deflate gate investigation. ESPN says it was a Patriots locker room attendant who presented an unapproved football to officials. He allegedly tried to give a football that hadn't been checked for air pressure to an official who became suspicious when he saw that the ball didn't have proper markings and because locker room attendants don't typically have ball handling duties. The official allegedly notified the NFL's VP of Game Operations, who supposedly examined the Patriots footballs at halftime and found that 11 of the 12 balls were under the league-mandated size. There are now three conflicting reports about the air pressure of the Patriot footballs at halftime. The city of blinding lights dimmed their most notable feature last night in honor of a sports legend. Every major Vegas Strip casino hotel dimmed their exteriors to go dark for three minutes starting at 10.30 last night. This was to honor legendary UNLV men's basketball coach Jerry Turkanian, who died February 11th at the age of 84. A darkened strip has honored the legacies of people like Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra, and Ronald Reagan. And when I think of legendary, you know what comes to my mind? Duke basketball. It was a showdown between college's mo basketball's most intense rivalry and the result was nothing short of spectacular. The two went back and forth trading big leads, shots, and chances. That was Winslow. Duke had the lead, but then UNC came back. Look at that Tokeno dunk. Tied at 81, they went into overtime. There's 3.5 seconds left when Duke fouled UNC, but the foul shot was missed and the game was over. The Blue Devils beat their rivals by the skin of their teeth, 92-89. to 89. Let's keep this overtime trend going. Head up to the north and take it to the rink. Bruins at Edmonton last night, a solid three periods of hockey. The Bruins came back to tie the game 3-3. And they took it into overtime, but there was still no winner. So you know what that means, a shootout. Here we go, there was one attempt after another. and. Finally, it was the 12th round of a shootout, and no one could score. So the Oilers put in Slovakian defenseman Martin Marinson. Keep in mind, this guy has never scored in the NHL. But on the 23rd shootout attempt, he got it. And it's on his birthday, too. How awesome is that? It may not have been necessarily pretty, but it sure counted. Edmonton's secret weapon gave him the W, 4-3 over Boston. And you guys know hockey is my sport, but I know mm -hmm. that you guys prefer football, so I have some news for you. Oh, Ooh. what is it? Well, BYU, tell. they just signed a contract with Utah State today, and the two teams are have a game coming up in 2019 and a game in 2020. Great. Oh my gosh, that seems like so far away right now. <laughs> it does but seem far away. will come faster. Huh? It's yeah. exciting. That's good for That's the school. Cool. Thanks a lot, Lily. And still to come on 11 News at Noon, fire and ice. How one burning building quickly turned into a frozen ice palace. We'll be right back. It has been very cold on the East Coast, we know, but a frozen building in West Philadelphia is proof of the low temperatures. As fire crews fought the blaze, the water from their hoses froze, leaving this unique display of fire and ice. The frozen palace is in stark contrast to the bright inferno the building was earlier. One witness described the flames as so bright it made the entire neighborhood look like it was burning. Oh my wow. gosh, it's literally like Elsa's castle. Yeah, I've never <laughs> seen anything like that in real life. Seriously. Gosh, Tawny, now I'm going to have Let It Go stuck in I my head. I know. Again. All no, day. I'm going to have, do you want to build a snowman? Like, do you oh, think yeah, they were asking for that? that? But Seriously. too bad we can't, with, we don't have snow here, but. Yeah, Wait, it's I in know. the forecast though, right, Avi? Yeah, that's so true. We, we might be able to. I don't think we can expect an ice castle like that. But. I mean, that would be pretty cool. I wonder if they were happier with the frozenness or. or the, the fire, you know, for now. Yeah. Anyways, thanks for joining us. That's your 11 News at Noon for Thursday, February 19th. For more information on our stories or to share them with your friends, check out our website at 11news.byu.edu. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.